looking at the title of my talk, I think that it deserves to be read with a loud, booming voice. No pun intended. Don't you think? Unfortunately, I don't have such voice. So I'll, instead, I'll give you two seconds to imagine in your head someone reading this with a loud, booming voice. Okay? Go. Okay. All set? Can we move on? Let's carry on. All right. So thank you for attending my talk. I'm uh, Pedro Fortuna. I'm CTO and co-founder of J Scrambler. Um, I'm also one of the OWASP Lisbon chapter leaders. Um, I think the other three are, might be somewhere in there, hopefully. And I mostly do AppSec, and sometimes I also do talks. It is well known that web applications are highly composable. Um, we even talk or think in terms of stacks. Uh, we even have acronyms like MERN or MEAN, uh, which is a good sign. It means that um, it's probably one of the biggest factors to have made web apps uh, like the standard way of delivering software to people. But we have to understand that it comes with a cost, okay? It makes us more exposed to supply chain attacks. I mean, unless you do something to counter that, of course. You don't believe me? See this. This has just happened. So it looks like a shady company was able to acquire polyfill.io and shocking revelation is now serving malware to about 100,000 websites. Or it's what they thought, because now Cloudflare CEO is saying like it's looking more, more like a million, more than a million websites being impacted by this. All right? So in this case, whoever sold the domain to the criminals could have known or not that they had this intent. We don't know. We might not ever know about that. But in some other situations, once popular domains just get abandoned, and, and someone, even criminals, can re-register those domains and start serving malware. And we call this a defunct domain attack. Um, and this isn't just theoretic. We actually found such an attack last year. And by we, I mean me and fellow researchers, uh, Pedro Marrush and David Alves, and a few others from the JScrambler team. So um, this talk will basically be like a chronological walk of the investigation that we did last year, where we uncovered more than a thousand websites being impacted by a defunct domain. So let's uh, start with the beginning, shall we? And we have a failure. We are supposed to be hearing something. Okay, let's skip that. So uh, we are always paying attention to potential new web scheming campaigns, and we also pay attention to others uh, working in, the, in this field. And in late 2022, this company, Gemini, which, by the way, has nothing to do with the, this other product that Google has, that you might have heard lately, lately um, they announced that they found uh, that this website, Tampa Bay 10, was compromised with uh, with a web schemer, and um, and basically that caught our attention, and we went to look, and we found this first stage infecting the website. So at first glance, it looks like the Google Analytics tag, but it's only disguising um, as Google Analytics. If you look closer, you can see that uh, it actually has like a couple of uh, base sixty four strings. And it's actually trying to load the second stage on that address. And the second base64 is the string checkout. If we clean that a little bit, we can see what the checkout is for. And this is very typical in web schemers. Uh, 
they basically insert a test where they only insert, they only load the second stage if the keyword checkout is found on the URL. So very typical, not surprising. So at this point, we were eager to have a look at the second stage, but by this time, we only found that tweet like a week after the infection. At that time, the second stage was no longer active, okay? So when that happens, uh, you can resort to a code search engine because they are scanning the web constantly and they cache the scripts that they see. So we, in this case, we resorted to urlscan.io and we got a copy of the uh, web schema, the second stage in this case, which is obviously obfuscated. Um, not a very good obfuscation, so very easy to reverse. We Obviously, we analyzed uh, the code, and it basically looked like the typical schema. Nothing fantastic about it. And I'm not entering into the details because it's not relevant for today's story. So at this point, we knew that... Uh, we knew how the attack worked. Um, we knew that it was no longer active. So what do we do? What do we do now? Is that it? No, of course. Um, we, we start looking. Let's look for other campaigns because like it's very common for like attackers to, to pivot, um, their codes to like do slight variations of the attack. So it's very likely to that other campaigns can be found very easily just by exploring what we're seeing in this particular campaign. So we went back and we compared the Google, the legitimate Google Analytics tag with the stage one code. And the first thing that we started thinking was the base64 strings. The first one was not that useful because it was the second stage URL and that changes from campaign to campaign to whatever is the affected website. But the second one is likely to be useful because as I said, it is very typical that they look for the checkout string on the URL. So it's, it's potentially a common factor of every campaign of web scheming out there. And other than that, it was also very obvious that the Google Analytics object string was broken in three pieces and it was made plural. And you might ask, why did they make it plural? It seems like a, a stupid mistake they did. No, it wasn't. Because you have to think that this code potentially is running alongside Google Analytics. And if it had the exact same object name, it would collide, and therefore, it would be likely that the attack is discovered sooner. And you know how these guys think. They, they want to like remain undetected for as long as they can. So we went to code search engines, and we searched for Google Analytics objects, and we got four additional victim websites. And OK, that's the start. Not impressive, so let's keep going and like try to search other combinations. So then we looked for Google Analytics objects, like the full concatenated uh, string, and we got 41 additional uh, victim websites. Obviously, we started looking uh, at these 41 endpoints or websites, and 11 of them kind of sticked out uh, for two reasons. One, because the, the, the first stage script that I've shown you was actually the second stage script this time around. And secondly, because they had a referrer header all, all pointing to this JavaScript library, which is called Web Cockpit. Okay? So, so this was getting exciting at this stage, you know, like, uh, so, uh, summing, summing that up, uh, we have the web cockpit library uh, somehow being loaded on these 11 websites. Then it loads our X first stage, now second stage script, which would then load one of two web schemers that we baptized as Danungo and get info. This is really not important for the talk, so I'll, I'll not zoom in on the web scheming. Okay, so in reality, the web cockpit's odyssey, our story, started here. So, hang on, let's go. 
So uh, giving you a little bit more detail, so all of these 11 websites, they had the web cockpits tag. They were loading the script. Obviously, at this point, it was pointing to a once de defunct domain uh, that was acquired by some criminals. So this was the malicious version of uh, web cockpit. And, and that was loading uh, the, the third stage uh, from a drop server that was always different, but usually from a dot digital domain. And then eventually it would run on the checkout page of the, the victim websites and collected the payment information and send that over to the same drop server, but a different endpoint. Okay? So if you are familiar with uh, web scheming, this is essentially how it goes. Like the rest are variations of, you know, requests and domains and etc. So let's uh, let's see. I want you to put a face to the attack. So let's see it in action. And this is one of the victim websites, and we can see that it contains the web cockpit scripts, and that it was able to load the third stage script. Okay. Obviously, we can take a look at the third stage. Okay, and you, I know that you cannot read that quickly, but it is fairly typical. So I'm just moving on and showing you the rest of the attack, which is actually buying something. Uh, and from the user perspective, nothing really different is happening. Uh, you might be you might need to sharpen up your Japanese to be able to understand that fully. But and at this stage, we only need to put the credit card information. And you see like this track.php, this is like telemetry. Uh, like the, it's sending like a, um, a copy of the content of all the fields. And at the very end, it sends like a big encrypted string which can be easily like decrypted and it contains like all the credit card details. And this is a web skimming attack. Okay? So now that you have an idea. Oh, let me put that back. So we had 11 uh, victim websites. All, pretty much all of them like small uh, Japanese um, merchant websites. And we went to Web, Web Archive to find that this company, Just Systems, held uh, possession of the Web Cockpit uh, script. And by looking and translating the page, of course, uh, we could find that we couldn't fully understand what they did, but it had to do something with uh, web hosting, which, you know, like kind of uh, fits the story a little bit, you know, because We'll get to that, but we didn't know now how these 11 victims uh, ended up with, with linking to this um, web cockpit uh, JavaScript. So, like I said, this is a chronological story, so you will hang on in there and I'll tell you. And then we went off to the internet to find like any news related with, uh, with web cockpit, like, uh, okay, someone must have found out that this web cockpit is was compromised, it was serving malware. And w the only thing that we could find was this tweet in Japanese that essentially said, the web cockpit was discontinued several years ago and was re-registered to a third party several months ago and contains suspicious scripts, okay? And, okay, this is a confirmation, not really helpful, but we kind of already knew this. Uh, but it also meant that it was mostly undiscovered uh, because this was essentially like the only thing that we could find talking about the problem at all. Like if it was a high profile attack, we would certainly would find more people talking about it. So we confirmed, uh, we went to the who is information of the domain, and we confirmed that it was re-registered like a year or something ago, and uh, it was now um, serving um, the website from a Russian IP address. So at this moment we thought, okay, this is like looking like a new uh, tactic for supply chain attacks. 
So criminals just like look for um, domains that were abandoned from once popular JavaScript libraries, and they just re-register. That's brilliant uh, because it's like really non-technical and low effort kind of attack. And a bunch of uh, websites are potentially already linking to that script because, you know, like how the web works. No one uh, does cleaning of uh, like missing links or whatever, like uh, especially like websites that have potentially been generated by some hosting company we didn't know at this stage. So we went back to the code search engines to look for more victims. And this is us using public www. We are just look, putting the URL there to find uh, websites that are linking to the web cockpit. And you can see a bunch of hits. You have to review those. Uh, some of them might be duplicates or might be false positives. And then this is us doing uh, a similar thing on show them. Uh, so you have to use a specific directive to search for uh, links, but essentially it's the same thing, and you have more hits now. And there is a cool feature in Show Them where they show you like where are geographically the hits, and it wasn't that a big surprise that all of these hits were very much concentrated in the Tokyo area. And by using the code search engines, we found more victims. So we now had 44 victims. But there were issues, uh, scaling efforts, basically, because at this moment, we started using code search engines manually. So the work to use all of them and to, and, and if we use like the, even like the premium service of these uh, code search engines, we could get more results. And manually reviewing all of that uh, was like quickly becoming like an impossible task. So we decided to automate. And we had like three automation requirements. Uh, the first one is integration with a, a good number of code search engines out of the box, but be extensible so we can add more in the future. And it had to filter false positives uh, as, as, as best as we could or uh, confirm infections. And last but not least, to archive a copy of the JavaScript, because the, the, some of these scripts are so ephemeral, like, uh, like tomorrow they might not be there. So um, sometimes you do a, a lot of data collection, and then you need some time to go through it. So you had to store like local copies of everything. And something that we could also add, but decided not to, um, was to do like a, a, a periodic reconfirmation of infection and, and build like a, like a timeline. So we might that do, do that in the future, but we decided like to cut on the work because, you know, like uh, there's so many hours of the day to do stuff. And I present you Vasco da Gama, which means or stands for Versatile Aggregator for Searching Code. If the name sounds familiar, it's because it's also the name of a famous Portuguese uh, explorer, um, which makes sense because we are also exploring the internet for like, uh, you know, like victim websites and using code search engines for that. Um, and a little piece of trivia, in uh, 1497, Vasco da Gama uh, became the first Western to go from uh, Western Europe to uh, India by sea only. And it took him 10 months to do that. So imagine how pissed he would be to know that today he can do that on a 14-hour flight from Lisbon, you know? And, and, and also he could be on for, uh, first class, so even better. Um, but you could also go by car, but unfortunately Google Maps couldn't calculate the route to India from Lisbon. And by the way, the 
Hoji Kode is uh, like the, the present name of Kalikut, which was the place where Vasco da Gama arrived. But it's funny because he could calculate uh, the number of days that it would take by foot. Um, and I did the math. So uh, if you leave now, I mean, like, leave after the talk, please. Um, you could arrive at Kalikut by September 30th in time for dinner. So start making those reservations. Now let me show you the Vasco architecture. So we have uh, this simple UI where you can make requests. And uh, the requests are sent to this abstraction layer, which basically uh, knows how to speak with uh, the code search engine's specific plugins. Um, so we're just like translating uh, those requests and eventually sending them to the, their specific APIs. And the responses are sent back to the abstraction layer, uh, which does some normalization of the results because every search code search engine has its own like uh, format. And, um, and then the, the results, uh, a list of domains basically is passed on to a deduplication module because there's a lot of like uh, common hits among like the different code search engines. Uh, even among the, the same code search engines, sometimes you have duplicates. Then on the second phase, we send a bot to fetch the HAR files. If you're not familiar with HAR files, they're basically like zip files that contain like all the timelines of loading a page, uh, like all the assets that were loaded, how, how, how much time they took, and it can also save a copy of the files that were loaded. So this is w what we were doing, and in order to do that, we were using this uh, well-known project called Chrome R Capturer that we were sending to for to every domain, um, and then like collecting all the R files. And this is second stage, and the third stage was uh, analyzing all of those R files. Okay, and then finally present the results like the confirmed victims. So what do we know with this? We know that these URLs potentially contain uh, the malicious search, um, I don't know, URL or whatever we are searching, it contains that or contained in the past. And for that, we send the Chrome hard capturer and then we reconfirm that they are still there. Okay? So we automated all of this. And with that, we got the number up to 985. But, uh, and you can see a, like a very quick demo of Vasco. Don't mind the UI. I know that it is ugly, but you know, like no one likes that you call your baby ugly. So keep it to yourself, please. Um, and at this stage, we are doing the search is sending to other code, to all the code search engines, and eventually you get the results in, you read all the results, you get like a nice consolidated list of domains, and now you send it to the bot. You see all of these windows popping up, which is like the Chrome HAR um, capturer, and at the very end, uh, you just feed the HAR files to the HAR analyzer, and you get the final results. Actually, you will see the analysis going on. So basically, when that when when that bar becomes all green, it means that we have analyzed all the R files that we have. Okay, and then you have the final list of confirmed um, victims. Uh, but we needed to know why. Uh, we we knew how. We knew that they had the web cockpit script, but we didn't know exactly why these websites, okay? Uh, we know, uh, we didn't know what else they had in common, uh, apart from being like uh, the majority were uh, like small Japanese websites. Um, so we had to find out. And we turned to the IP addresses behind these do domains, and we found that one of the IP addresses had 260 domains. Okay, this is interesting. Let's zoom in on that for a second. 
And we did the reverse DNS and found like a domain uh, whose owner was just systems. And that didn't return any website, but we Googled that domain and we found another subdomain of the same domain that uh, basically in Japanese as well, but if you translate the title of the page, we could read home page builder service. Okay? That makes sense. Okay? That, like, you know, all pieces are finally, like, falling in place and we are discovering all of the story we had to know. But this is only for 260. What about the others? So we, we had to look deeper. And we still on the 260, we started seeing these like meta elements saying just systems, home page builder version. Okay, but at the beginning of the story, maybe we looked at that and didn't give it like a, a second of thought, you know? But now this is like uh, sticking out, like this is like obviously. And not only that, but we could see a lot of codes using the HPB, home page builder prefix. So we asked, uh, what about the other 700 uh, domains? Do they have these uh, things as well? And it turns out that they did. So uh, roughly 95.1% uh, were associated with just systems. They either were using the home page builder or another product from them called Internet Shop Owner. So um, as far... Um, as we care, this is the story. This is the story that we were looking for, okay? So we now understand everything, how it happened. Basically, these merchants, um, they potentially don't know the first thing about building pages. Um, they just wanted a store. They went to this provider, um, potentially like a local Japanese uh, thingy that they have, and they just ask them, like, make me a website where I can sell stuff, you know? And they had like a page, a home page generator, and also with the checkout experience. And that was injecting automatically the web cockpit library. At some point, they lost control of that library, but that was too late because all of those pages were already generated. Okay? So that's how it came to be. And sometime later, a criminal notice. And, you know, all it takes is seeing a 404. You see a 404, that's an opportunity for the attacker. Uh, if they can get control of the domain, that is. So we started like uh, doing responsible disclosure. We reached out to the victims, which wasn't easy because most of them, we couldn't find the contact. Um, and we had uh, no success in contacting just systems uh, either. So as we were just about to contact the, the, the authorities responsible for the Japanese DNS, something happened. The web cockpit domain became free to register. And what did we do? We took it. Would you do the same? Yeah? Show of hands? Okay, not all of you. I'm surprised. Um, yeah, I would expect like more hands, but that's fine. I don't judge. Please don't judge me. Um, and with that, we could find 2,408 victims. Uh, we were not serving any JavaScript, not even an innocuous JavaScript. We were returning 404s, which in a way will tell will still tell the, the, the infected website that they have an issue that they can fix if they want to. Not that they would, because, you know, like they were in, involved in this problem in the first place. It's because they are not noticing anything. But I, I mean this as we're not, we're being as, as subtle and non-impactful as possible to these websites, because there's an ethical thing to do, of course. And so we were returning 404s, but it was enough to log referrers. And looking through the results, they were mostly like the other websites, so uh, nothing really changed. Uh, it was the same story, uh, but we are still coming through that data um, even today. 
But there's more. We decided to run Vashko again. And we found almost 5,000 potential victims at this stage, which told us that when you rely on code search engines, Basically, it's a very volatile thing. Like, if you run it again t tomorrow, you'll get different results. And, and that's okay. It's just important to be aware of that. And these are like seven lessons that we learned by doing this work. Uh, the first one I, it's covered. The second one is also related with volatility, which is like these APIs, they very often have outages, uh, timeouts, and, and uh, it's not that um, reliable in that sense. And uh, if you upgrade to premium, you get a lot more results. And sometimes we even find duplicates within the same code search engine. So the real number of uh, infected victims is usually significantly lower but that doesn't re remove the value of using this approach. So if uh, this is something that hopefully you will find useful, maybe you'll find chances of uh, applying the same methodology. Um, we found that search variations can lead to significant differences in search results, and all except one, FOFA, on are only indexing the front page of a website which is an important limitation to be aware of. So now that we know that this is a problem, uh, let's think about it for a minute. So the first thing is let's uh, propose a definition for defunct domains. Um, so we believe that a defunct domain should be a root level domain, okay, something that you can register that was once used to serve resources, um, meaning JavaScript in this case, directly or from a subdomain, it doesn't matter, because if you control the main domain, you can always like uh, uh, create the subdomain, and that is now available to re-register or to take ownership or, or control. But it could also be a subdomain from a service, a third-party service that lets you take control. For instance, think about like GitHub, like you can take control of some subdomains. And if that subdomain for some reason once was used uh, by a library, by a JavaScript, that is valid too, I think. And the other one, I'm not so sure uh, that it had to be once popular because if it, no one was linking to this defunct domain, it doesn't matter. Like uh, you cannot, it's not appealing to attackers. So I'm on the fence about that one. I'm leaning towards like it had to be popular, somehow popular. Like a lot of websites are still linking to that, um, to a link on that particular domain or subdomain. So the, our question at this point was uh, how widespread is the problem? So we found one defunct domain. How many defunct domains are out there? This is probably your question too at this stage. And so we decided to build a scanner and to scan the web and look for other uh, defunct domains. And there are a few challenges. Um, scanning the web takes a lot of time. You have to decide things like, um, uh, what's the timeout? How, how, how many seconds do you wait until like you close that connection? Um, how many instances of your bot you're releasing? Are you scanning only the front page or are you trying to crawl throughout like the, the, the inside the, the, the web page? And some sites are protected with anti-bot, so they won't let you uh, even load the page properly. So the scanning is ongoing. We don't have the definitive answer yet, um, but we wanted to give you a taste. So in the last week, we ran the scanner uh, over a thousand websites, and we found two other defunct domains, which is 0.2%. Uh, these, the two defunct domains are 24. HODSK and sealbagsshop.de. Can we conclude anything from this sample? Well, we can try. Um, on the internet, we have approximately 1.98 billion websites, uh, but only 18% of that are considered to be active websites. So that's still like in the order of hundreds of millions. 
And if we multiply that by 0.2%, that would result in a number over 400,000 uh, potential defunct domains. Do we believe this? Do we? Well, I have to admit that I don't. Um, because we have to account for the other factors. Okay? So, um, are these domains being linked to? And all of the other things that I've uh, mentioned. So, um, in the meantime, we are releasing the, our scanner for free, so you can use it to scan, to monitor your uh, websites. And it's a recurring uh, monitoring, so, um, so you just configure it once, and you get alerts, like if we find uh, defunct domains on your website. We only let you uh, scan your own uh, domains, because we don't want to help the bad guys, you know, like find opportunities. So that's the only caveat. Um, and another thing that it does, it also checks for the proximity of uh, domains almost expiring. So you get a warning, like you can see like, oh, I have to watch out for these. And the URL is over there, defunctdomains.com. So here's the demo of that. Very short demo. Okay, can make it faster. This is the dashboard. You add the domain to scan. In this case, I'm adding one of the two uh, recent uh, defunct domains that we found this week. Put in a justification. Then you have to wait for it to be approved unless like you're scanning your own domain um, associated with your email address. And you you wait and you get the results in. So you're still waiting, so it was approved, and now here are the results. So defunct detected, and this is how the report looks like. So you see a lot of like different domains where we couldn't find them to be defunct, uh, but down, scrolling down, you can see like this helpdesk dot uh, service, it is a defunct domain, and we confirmed it is a confirmed. Um, defunct domain. So learning so far, basically accounting with false positives and false negatives. So on the false positives, there's a lot that we need to deal with. So for instance, some domains could be reported as defunct when in reality it's some file whose web server is not serving to you because you are in the wrong part of the world or something, like they're regional. Um, and sometimes it's just a typo, so people just type the wrong domain, and of course it's not registered. So is it a, do a defunct domain? No, it isn't. Remember the definition. It needs to be impactful. It needs to be like people need to be linking to that. And there's also some issues in parsing who is information because you know like there's not a standard format, um, multi-lang, different date formats, blah blah blah, and. And some defunct domains simply weren't like serving JavaScript at all, so how can they, uh, they can be like defunct domains? And some subdomains were being detected as, as defunct domains, but they couldn't be like taken control of. And on the false negative side, we have the anti-bots that I've already mentioned. And, um, our bot, and this is by design, does not follow redirects. Because, you know, like, what, what would you do? Like, if you cannot scan the whole internet, you would scan always the same website, but redirecting to a different domain. So in order to prevent that, we uh, basically told our bots, don't follow redirects. And sometimes that might get in the way of like uh, legitimate scannings. Um, and sometimes it is potentially a DD, but uh, just not impactful, because a little like websites, number of websites are linking to it. Um, so we might bring that to the tool in the future, like just like letting you know how many links we found linking to the defunct domain, and then you can take a decision whether you are worried about that or not. Uh, one last thought, the one of the defunct domains that we found uh, was actually reported last January as having a web schemer. And what do you do when you find a web schemer? Anybody? 
what's usually the consequence of finding a web schemer? You what? No, what do you do if you are defending, if, if we want to mitigate the problem? Basically, what you usually do is you take down the domain. Now think about that for a second. What, what happens when you take down a domain? Eventually, it might become available again. So no wonder like it's being detected by a defunct domain. As far as we know, it's not being exploited, but it could. It could, because we potentially all these results, like you could register the domains again and start serving malware. So we have to think. So my thought is, are we doing it wrong? Should we revise like a new domain ownership governance model? I've been thinking about this and would love to hear your thoughts. So we're almost wrapping up. Uh, so defunct domains, yet another supply chain attack. Uh, with that, attackers can uh, deploy malware, redirect to fake websites. They can steal like sensitive information. And it's a real attack, uh, which we have proven by showing you that we found an instance that was affecting like uh, almost 5,000 websites. Okay, they were like very small websites, but still, like it's a real attack. And it's a low effort, high return, which, you know, like uh, attackers love this, you know, like low hanging fruit stuff, non technical. Um, so we still don't know how widespread the problem is, so stay tuned because it's uh, our intention to publish more on that. But I want to know, we want to know what do you think? And for that, I will ask you to point to this slide, though, and in like 20 seconds, um, give me your what do you think. Ten votes are in. How do I see this like? Oh, okay. So it's so they should be already be fairly common. This is the most voted answer. Thank you for that. And that, that's followed by they are rare, but they will likely become more common. So it seems like most of us here seems like it, it is worth um, investigating a little bit more about this problem. It can potentially get worse, so it has some value in researching this. Great, thank you. And last but not least, please register an account and give us your feedback. It is not a commercial service. It is not our intention that it becomes a commercial service. So just use it if you find it useful and give us feedback. And this is what I had for today. Thank you. Uh, do you have any questions from the audience? Oh, quite a few. <laughs> Starting here. Uh, great talk, Petra. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, what do you make of the fact that you approached uh, just systems, I think, and very close to that occasion, they kind of took off the, like, the, the domain got freed. Do you, like, uh, see, like, a, maybe a suspicious connection, or did you not look at it that way? Well, I cannot speculate to that, because I, we don't know. It might be a coincidence, and time-wise, it wasn't, like... It, it was, I think we took our time before we went to the authorities. So it might be like a two months period between them. But I cannot speculate to that. I don't know. Like I've never was able to speak with the just systems people. So I don't know. It's just all I know is that it became available and it seems like very surprising. Um, we can, uh, we can speculate like Maybe the, that particular attack or defunct domain wasn't being like too profitable for the attackers or they just like moved to something more profitable and you know, like their attention span by, might be like reduced. I don't know. Uh, next questions. 
Thanks a lot for the talk. Um, I, I want to suggest you also to have a look at the images, uh, like defunct domain, which serve the images, like SVG especially, because you can have JavaScript in SVG and think how common images from other domains are. Like, I guess they are more common than scripts from other domains. Oh, absolutely. Um, absolutely, eventually we'll get there. I think that JavaScript is more common uh, for two reasons, or more interesting for two reasons, at least to start with. First, because that's where uh, code search engines are focusing, and remember, we're leveraging them. So if they're not really like interested in like, indexing SVGs, they might not be um, like a, a foot to stand um, for that research. And also because uh, it usually starts with someone legitimately linking to something that they need. And I can argue that it's less likely that people link to SVGs on other domains than it is to link for JavaScripts. That's not the only reason, but I think that you're right. Yeah, like I, I can imagine, for example, the blog post, like where you can just put the images, right? Like this is also uh, like just users share their memes or something, right? Like uh, it's also... Um, no, image that's, hosting that's was the point. thing uh, a while ago, remember, like uh, where you can serve the images. That's a good point. Thank you. Uh, there was another question from there. Um, yeah, first of all, thank you so much for the wonderful talk. Um, I was wondering out of the um, victim domains, uh, what were their uh, relative popularity? Uh, were there any popular parties? Um, because I'm expecting that most popular domains use uh, SRI, uh, sub-resource integrity, to make sure that um, like what they load is actually what they've uh, uh, expected to be. Mm, I'm not sure I, I got your question. Like, you, uh, so, what are, are the popularity of the of these uh, domains uh, in particular? Domains, yeah. Well, not at all. Like, not not popular at all. Like, uh, um, it could be a tip. Like, you could look at the popularity as a way, like, to try to see if there's a pattern. Uh, but we couldn't get anything from that in this particular case. But I think it's a relevant thing to look at in future like incidents. Any final question? <laughs> Sorry. So with Vasco, is that an available externally or that's just something you're running internally? Uh, Vasco is only internal, but okay. we're willing to share that with other fellow researchers if you need to. Um, it's not, the reason why we're not already sharing is because it's not looking like great software at this moment, uh, to be like super honest about it. Um, you know, like, First, you are assembling stuff just to get the results. You're not really worried about like writing beautiful software. Uh, that's potentially like the only reason why it's uh, not being shared with everybody uh, just yet. But if you are interested in in doing something similar, we're more than willing to share uh, that tool uh, in whatever way we find to do that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, well, great. Thank you. Great presentation. Thank you.